Our next speaker needs no introduction, because he already had one. <laughs> And uh, we are fortunate to have uh, Father Larry come back up and uh, charge us up again. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Father Larry Richards back to Okay, again, let's turn to Jesus and pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you created us to be your men, to be your presence in the world. And when people would look at us, they would no longer see us, Lord, but you, Lord Jesus, living inside of us. Take control of us so fully that we would give your name glory all the days of our life. We beg you these things, Lord Jesus, in your most holy name. Amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, gentlemen, does anybody remember, if, any of the, if you've read my stuff or anything, my favorite verse in the Bible, which will be on my gravestone when I die at 120, because the good die young. Galatians 2, 19 and 20, very good. You get out of purgatory early. So what happens is, this is what it is to be a follower of Jesus. Galatians chapter 2, and, you, and now it's just 20, but the old translation is 19 and 20. And Galatians 2, 19 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. So the life I live now is no longer my own. Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I still live my human life, yes, but it's a, it's a life of faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his life for me. That in reality, gentlemen, to follow Jesus, you need to die. You need to be crucified with Christ. Now, we do that sacramentally, of course, when you are baptized. But a sacrament, what does it take, gentlemen, to make a sacrament work according to the teaching of the Holy Roman Catholic Church? More than grace, grace is always there. Faith. Faith unlocks the sacrament. So the problem here, gentlemen, is that if you ever notice, how old are kids when they get confirmed down here? What grade? 14. Woo. Okay, so you have a 14-year-old and you confirm them. Does anything change after confirmation in this kid's life? Not really. Look at Mass. How many people go to communion, walk right out the miserable door, are still mean to their wife and kids, are still swearing like truckers, all these things, and yet they receive with that tongue the God of the universe. Why doesn't anything change? No faith. God is right there in the most blessed sacrament. And yet, we might have came in here and genuflected. Some of you did not. I watched you. And the reality is, had hats on, did all these things, did all these realities. Why? You're in the presence of Almighty God. <sighs> really? Are we done yet? We should be on our faces before Almighty God in the Blessed Sacrament. If we just had the faith that's necessary, you know, and if we had the faith that was necessary to, cre to release these sacraments, people think it's magic. I just go through the motions, I go to confession. Gentlemen, you're going to confession today. Good job. But if you don't have faith that expressed itself in the word repentance, are you forgiven? No. Let's say you come to confession and you sit there and say, I committed adultery. But in your heart of hearts, you are going to tend to keep committing adultery. You just are going to fly, and you don't want to fly in case the thing goes down, the plane goes down, you want to make sure that you're right with God. Well, God knows your heart. So if you're not repentant, are you forgiven? No. You can be crying and be really sorry. <laughs> Unless you're repentant, you're not forgiven. That is the teaching of the Holy Roman Catholic Church. So when you go to confession today and you say, I missed Mass on Sunday, what does that mean? I'll never miss Mass on Sunday again. Period. I go to confession today. I looked at porn. To be forgiven, what does that mean? You'll never look at porn again. Period. Necessary for forgiveness is repentance. 
And see, that means you're dying to yourself. You're being crucified. Now, in reality, we are all sinful human beings. But we can't just focus on that. We got to focus who we are. Again, this morning, let's go to the Bible for a second. I was in Romans this morning is what I came to when I opened up the word. And I was in Romans chapter 8. And if you go to Romans chapter 8, I love the first line. This is the one I'm going to talk on. But in Romans, in Romans chapter 8, it sits there and says there is... Anybody know? Romans chapter 8 verse 1. Anybody know what that is? There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So again, I'm not here, first of all, to condemn you. It sounds like I am, I know sometimes, because I'm, I'm harsh. But the way I used to tell my boys when I used to teach the all-boy high school, I would sit there and say, gentlemen, these little freshmen coming in, I will be your spiritual drill instructor. For these next four years, I will do everything to get you to heaven. You might think I hate your guts, but I'll always be there for you, gentlemen. And they used to go, this guy's nuts. <laughs> one day I'm walking through the hall and one of the kids didn't, uh, and they didn't think I had good hearing because I was, you know, it was 20 years ago. I still had good hearing. And I'm going through and I'm in front of Jesus. So Jesus, close your ears just for a second. Because as I'm walking through the hall, one of the little freshmen looked at the guy next to him and said, there's the bastard. <laughs> Can you imagine? Well, the word bastard's in the Bible, Hebrews chapter 12. Anyway, but that's all beside the point. Anyway, so I sat there and I said, son, come here. Oh, yes, father, yes, father. I'm sorry, father. I'm sorry, father. I said, it's father bastard to you. Do you understand me? <laughs> yes, father. I get it. The reality is this. We are called to be men of love. And to be a man of love doesn't mean you tiptoe through the tulips. To be a man of love means you give your life away for others. The good general talked a lot about what it is to be a man, to sacrifice yourself for others. That's what it must be to be a man of God. We give our life away for others. You know, again, the day I drop dead, I want to be able to hear God the Father look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't know what you want. That's all I want. And that means the only way that'll happen is if I gave my life with Christ, that I was crucified with him so I could bring other people to him. And that means we we'll need to be willing to do anything. You know, I have that radio show, and so some of you listen to it, and that's where I get in my most trouble because on the radio show, I got to be more gentle than I am today with you guys because I only have three minutes, and there's little old ladies that call and young people and kids that call. And so Dr. Ray says, I'm going to start sitting down to pee all the time because of my radio show. He thinks I'm getting too soft. And so, but what I do is I'm trying to be pastoral, trying to meet people where they are to get them where God wants them to be. And so a person asked me a question, and I said, well, you got to pray about it. I can't tell you what to do because it was one of those questions that, you know, you need more than three minutes and you need to discuss someone. But people want to say, just don't do that. Blah, blah. Okay. So a priest called me on the phone and he says, uh, Father, uh, can I take you to task for something you said? I said, oh, please, Father, of course. And he says, well, when you told someone to do this or you said you have to pray about it, you were encouraging the big part of a big, uh, the nine ways to help participate in mortal sin. I said, I never even heard that before, Father. It's in the catechism. Okay, Father. And he says to me, he says, now, I'm very disappointed in you, Father, because, you know, it was your confession tape or uh, CD that brought me into the faith and wanted me to be a priest and da, da, da. And you're getting soft. Okay, Father. I said, how long have you been ordained? One year. Okay. I said, have you ever been a pastor? No. And I said, Father, would you be willing to go to hell to get someone else to heaven absolutely not St. Paul said he would remember when Paul says I would hope to be lost if I could save some of them what God wants us to do gentlemen is get over living for ourselves about me going to heaven about me not going to hell, but me bringing everybody I can with me. 
You know, we have hard as nails kids here that work with Justin Fatika, and he's coming down here. Well, Justin Fatika was one of my students at Cathedral Prep, where I taught. And if you don't know Justin Fatika, he's, uh, you know, he's on EWTN, and he's this kid, he's 40 years old now, but he was one of my first students I ever had at Cathedral Prep. And when I was sitting there teaching, when you teach all boys, now we had anywhere from 650 to 700 boys at our high school. One year we had 666 boys. Six, 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 the sign of the Antichrist. So we threw one out the first week to get that number. But anyway, <laughs> as we sat there, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing on the board, and he was a joke. Anyway, I'm writing on the board. I was teaching morals. He was a junior in high school. And as I'm writing and teaching, I look around, and there's Justin Fatika in the front row, and or Teka in the third row, and he has his hands behind his back like this, and his shoes off, and his stocking feet on the, on the chair in front of him. Oh. And I went up to him, you get your feet off that desk now! And he looked at me and said, you say please. <laughs> Oh, gentlemen, I took him, I threw him out of there, I said, you get the heck out of my classroom. And he says, I'm going to tell my, no, first of all, he said, you're a jerk, you're a jerk, it's because of people like you that people don't go to cathedral prep, because of people like you, you're a jerk. I said, get out of my classroom, he says, I'm going to tell my dad. Whoa. So anyway, afterwards, as an aside, I went and called his dad, and I said, Mr. Fatika. I threw your son out of my class today. He's being a jerk and I won't have it in my classroom. And he wasn't like a lot of fathers today, like, you yelled at my little boy? My perfect little child? How dare you yell at him? He said, wait till he gets home, father. <laughs> my type of father. None of these wimpy ones that sit down. You touch my little boy. Oh my, my little boy. Your little boy needs to man up is what he needs. He needs someone that's going to kick him in the butt. Not just his father, and hopefully you do. But he needs other men to challenge him. Gentlemen, have you figured out life is not easy? And when we coddle our boys... We make them little fruitcakes that are not the men that God's creating them to be. It's all about them. They need to be kicked in the butt every once in a while. It's just the way it is. Anyway, beside the point. I, he started on me, screaming at you, calling me a jerk and everything else, even out in the hall. I ran out in the hall, I grabbed him, I threw him up against the wall, and I screamed at him. Now, if you read my Be A Man book, he's the last chapter in my book. If you read his book, Hard as Nails, I'm the first chapter in his book. <laughs> but while I am screaming at him, I will not tell you what I said to him because, again, in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and I had to go to confession for it. But I'm screaming at him. I pull him up against the wall, and I said, you are a... Um, it begins with an A, and it ends with a hole. You understand that word? <laughs> And I'm screaming it to him. And you don't stop cutting your when you're, you're this, you're this. And don't you come back to my classroom till you stop being that bad word. That's what I said. But you know what he heard? It's in his book. And when we do talks together, it's so funny to see. Because Justin Fatika says, And Father Larry Richards, he threw me out of the classroom. He threw me up against the wall. Spits coming out of his mouth. His unibrow is going crazy. His pores are wide open. And he screams at me. You haven't reached your potential. You haven't reached your potential. And don't you come back to my class till you reach your potential. That's not what I said. <laughs> but that's what he heard. I was speaking in tongues that day. <laughs> but anyway, true statement. Now again, and then I was having a retreat because I had this uh, retreat and... <laughs> And I used to sit there and I was praying my whole hour every day and he says, I want you to invite Justin Fatico on the retreat. No. No way. And I was listening and and one day I was purposely, not, I, I remember this clear as day, I brought the newspaper in with me to my whole hour and I was like a little child reading the newspaper. I'm not listening to you. I'm not listening. Don't talk to me. I will not invite that little jerk to my, I can't stand him. He's the pain in my back pew. I ain't going to do it. And finally I go, okay, I'll do it. 
but he's not going to come anyway. So I'll never forget in class, I said, Fatika, yeah, Father, we're having a retreat. You want to come on this retreat? I already know Jesus, Father. I said, well, maybe you could teach the rest of us about him. Oh. <laughs> Justin, and I used to sit in his classroom, in his, in his desk, and saying, God, I hate this kid. And I did. You got to change my heart to him. You got to change my heart to him. He came on the retreat, which I gave, and he came to great conversion. Justin goes around the world now, bringing people to Jesus Christ. And there isn't two weeks that I don't, it goes by, sometimes three where Justin doesn't call me and say, Father, I love you. Thank you for bringing me to Jesus. And I go, shut up. I don't want to hear it. Oh, Father, you got to take it. You got to take it. I love you. Shut up. Just shut up. But the reality is that even though I was hard on this kid, that's what it took to bring him to Christ. We got to be willing to do anything. You know, today, in the, if they do the regular readings of the day today, you're going to hear in the gospel, unless they do Sunday's Mass, but if they do Saturday's Mass, the gospel today is what? Does anybody know? Love your enemies. That's not a suggestion. It's a command. And so if I want to love, because my enemy was Justin Fatika. He just was. But I, the Lord kept on my prayer because I was listening to him as I talked about. And he tells me, I want you to do that. And I had to finally obey. And that brought that kid to salvation and thousands of other people to salvation because Justin has brought thousands and thousands of people to salvation in Jesus Christ. But it wouldn't have happened if I wouldn't have got over myself and put God first. And so what we got to do is when we do this, so again, to go back here to continue in, in Romans chapter 8, what Jesus told me this morning was Romans chapter 8, the exact quote I gave you a little bit was quote 9, verse 9. It says, but you are not in the flesh. You are not in the flesh. You are in the spirit, since the spirit of God dwells within you. In dealing with men, Often they'll sit there and if I'll talk, oh, Father, I'm just a sinner. I'm just a sinner. I'm just a sinner. And I always go, you're not just a sinner. If you just define yourself by that, then what you are is you're going to sin because why? You're just a sinner. Oh, big surprise, I sin. That's a Protestant theology. I'm just saved by grace. It doesn't matter what I do. Oh, you are saved by grace, absolutely. But it matters a lot what you do because you have been crucified with Christ. So the life you live now is no longer yours. Jesus Christ lives inside of you. So this is the difference, gentlemen. Who are you looking at? What are you looking at? Are you looking at Christ inside of you or you? Because if you look at you, you'll just see a sinner. That's nice. But Christ lives inside of you. You know, again, the, the, the Holy Word of God sits there and talks about, you know, and again, I usually don't talk about this so explicitly, but the, uh, I'm going to find it now. But it says in here, if you go and have sex with a prostitute, Paul's saying, what does that mean? You make Christ one with a prostitute. Why? Because anything you do, Jesus lives inside of you. So if you just focus on yourself as a sinner, I'm just a sinner, saved by grace, then you make Jesus sin inside of you when you sin. Really? I used to tell my boys at the school, I'd say, gentlemen, none of you would ever bring your girlfriend in front of the tabernacle and have sex with your girlfriend in front of the tabernacle, would you? And they'd always say, Father, that's disgusting. A few of them would go, hmm. <laughs> I said, if you'd never bring your girlfriend and have sex with them in front of the tabernacle at the cathedral, which is our, our chapel, was the cathedral of Erie, I said, if you would never bring your girlfriend in there and bring, uh, have sex with them in front of the Blessed Sacrament, you better not do it anywhere else. Why? Where is Jesus? Inside of you. So, what are you looking at, gentlemen? Are you looking at you? Are you looking at Christ inside of you? One, you'll always have an excuse for your weakness. 
You always have an excuse. Oh, I'm just a sinner. Uh Uh-uh. You're a son. And you have God who dwells within you. So our job is to get out of the way and show the world Jesus. Gentlemen, God is not a divine, ra- he's not a divine cheerleader. You know what, like a, he, he, God isn't looking down at you and going, okay guys, you can do this. Come on, I'm, I'm gunning for you guys. You can do it. You can. Ah, you messed up there, you know. Ugh. I'm so disappointed. God is inside of you. And he says, your job is to get out of the way. And let me live my life through you. And we do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. But, you know, there's a great book by Francis Chan. And he's a Protestant guy, but he's, he's talking about the real presence of Jesus. They think he's going to be converting, but that's all beside the point. Francis Chan has a great book out, one of the best books ever in my life. And it's called Crazy Love. Crazy Love. And in this book, he sits there and first of all talks about, first of all, are we in people in love with God? You know, so the, he asked he asked one of these very simple questions. What if you could go to heaven and in heaven, your, all your family would be there, your kids would be there, your wife would be there, you'd have all the money you'd want, you'd have all the power, you'd have peace forever, you'd live forever, you got everything. The only caveat is Jesus isn't there. Would you go? And most people are, you know, thinking, I'm supposed to say no, but yeah, I'd go, sure. Then you're not a Christian. Because a Christian wouldn't go anywhere without Jesus. He's what you love the most, so it wouldn't be heaven without Jesus. And then he has another book called, a book called Forgotten God. And in this book, Forgotten God, he says, what if you wanted to be a great football player, a basketball player, whatever, and you keep praying, God, come on, I want to be the best, I want to be the best, I want to be the best. And God finally appears to you and he says, what can I do for you? And you say, I want to be the best football player that ever knew on this earth. He goes, great, I'll tell you what. I will live inside of you and I will play football for you. Do you think you'd be a good football player? You'd be the best. Well, that's what God does to us. He says, you want to be a Christian? Yes, I want to be a Christian, but I'm so weak. Ah, I will come inside of you and I will be a Christian for you, with you, in you. You get out of the way. (gasps) That means off to die. Exactly. You got to die to yourself so Jesus can live. So you people can say, he no longer lives. Jesus Christ lives inside of him. You can proclaim, I no longer live. Jesus Christ lives inside of me. I got to get out of the way and show the world Christ, right? There's one question everybody asks us as they ask the apostles. Sir, we would like to see Jesus. When people look at you, do they see Jesus? That's the point. And to do that, we got to make sure that, we, you know, the story, I don't know if I told the story here before, I've told it in my book and that, but it's one of my favorite stories, it's a true story. And it's a story about a man who was captured, he was a... Uh, uh, in the army or the service, whatever, he was probably a Marine, of course. And he goes and he was taken, he was captured, and he was put in the Japanese prisoner of war camp. And they treated him badly. But at the same time, there was a Japanese man who believed the Americans were in the right, and he was, there, he was trying to help the Americans. He was captured and put in the same cell as the American, but he was tortured badly because he was a traitor. And they would beat him and torture him. And every day, the American, who was a Christian, would kneel next to him and take his own food and give it to this Japanese man and try as best as he could to heal the Japanese man, clean his wounds, everything. And he did this for about a month. One day, they threw the Japanese man in with the American and they had tortured him so bad that the American knew he wasn't going to make it through the night. He was going to die. So he knelt next to him and he goes, you know... You're probably going to die tonight. But you don't have to be afraid. If you just surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you will live forever. And you know what the Japanese man said to the American? He said, if this Jesus is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Could people say that about us? Oh, Father, if Jesus is anything like you, 
I can't wait to meet him. <laughs> Could your wives say that about you? Oh, honey bun, if Jesus Christ is anything like you, I can't wait to meet him. Could your kids say that about you? Could your neighbors say that about you? Could your employees say that about you? Our job is to show the world Jesus Christ. That's period. You know, so again, when I do weddings, I'm not weddings, uh, baptisms. I don't know why kid people ask me to do baptisms these 32 years, besides me being a priest. But the reality is, I do it all the time. You do realize when the Word of God says, call no man father, he was not talking about priests. Who was he talking about? You. He was talking about the person who had sex with your mother, your father. That is not your father. They did not call priest father. So I love when a fundamentalist says, call no man father. I say, what do you call your dad? Well, he didn't mean that. That's exactly what he meant. So gentlemen, so every time I do a baptism, there they are in the front row. If it's at mass, I always love to do this the most. And I always sit there and I say, now, we all know that Joe is not the father of this child. And everybody goes, and the woman turns beet red, but they're all used to me now because who is the father of this child? God is the father of this child. Gentlemen, you are not the father of your children. God is. You're supposed to show them God. You are Saint Joseph to your children. God used you to bring forth eternal life. But he's the true father. And so when they look at you, they're looking for God. You show them God. Again, Danny Abramowitz, who's with me on EWTN, remember he used to play for the Saints, he was a coach, he still has some of the great uh, uh, records when he played football. He loves when we're doing a men's conference together. And, you know, the two of us together are really hard hitting. I really like when I'm with Dan, even though he's an older man now, but I love it. And he says, gentlemen, your kids, especially your boys, will always love their mother. But they want to be just like you. Who do you show them? Do you show them a man who's worried about more than anything else, sports, and whether your team won, about money, about power, about prestige? Or do you show your kids God? Because that's what you're supposed to do. In my new book, the opening line is, we are created by love to be love in a world that doesn't know love. It's just that simple. You and I are called to be love incarnate. And we only do that when we're men of prayer and we come to know how much we're loved. And then we want to bring that forth, right? That that's the point. Now, again, when I talk about being a man of love, I am not talking about tiptoeing through the tulips. I am not talking about, you know, the word our, the our father, the, you know, the first principle is that we're called to love everyone without exception. That's what a Christian does. Now, is that easy? It's impossible, but not by us. When you can't love someone, you say, Jesus, I can't love them, but you can. I give you permission to love them through me. You just got out of the way and you let Jesus do what he wants in your life. And see, that's what's got to happen. Too many people see Christianity as just trying to be a good man, obeying the commandments. You can go to daily mass and be an atheist. You can be a priest of Jesus Christ and be an atheist. I know some. Just because you're a priest and you look holy does not make you holy. Is that true? And it's been proven with the scandal again and again. People, leadership is not the authority given to you by someone else. Leadership is you get up and you lead by example. Right? And so just because someone says, well, I'm a priest. Do you know Jesus Christ? Huh? You get out of the way, Father, and you show me Jesus. You get out of the way, Father is here, and you show me Jesus. Your kids are not here to be in your image and likeness. 
They're called to be like Jesus. That means we got to show them. And we got to be dying to ourselves so much that when they look at me, they just see Jesus. So, could your kids say that about you, those of you who are married and fathers? Could they tell their friends, my dad is the most loving man I know. Could your kids say about you, my dad is the most loving man I know. He's a strong man, big discipline man, challenges me, has punished me, but he loves me beyond anything. Because that's what we're called to do. And so as we do that, as we decide this, we got to make sure in our families, you know, I love when I do a parish mission to do a talk called family. And I just want to give you, for the last 15 minutes, just a mini version of that talk. So family spelled F-A-M-I-L-Y, correct? The first word is F. What's F for? Faith and forgiveness. What's F for? Faith and forgiveness. You need to show your children faith. And you have to model that. You can't just say, you will do, like, my dad, <laughs> something. You all know my father died of alcoholism, and you know the story. I've told it here many times. But anyway, my dad had a saying, you do as I say, not as I do. Stupid, stupid, hypocritical person that would ever say that to their children. Your kids want to be just like you. They're going to do what you do. So my dad smoked. So that's, that's what I did. Smoked, why? Because I want to be like my dad. So my father set me down a, a, a tradition of killing myself by smoking. Because if you smoke, you're killing yourself. You're ruining the temple of the living God. But my father started me like that. I don't give it to smoke now. But I wanted to be like my dad. My father was a man. He smoked. My father was a man. He drank. I drank, I smoked. Because I want to be like my dad. You need to show them who God is by your actions. Don't you ever say, do as I say, not as I do. And how many, I ain't going to ask how many do it, but you know, there's a good many of you that have. So faith and forgiveness, forgiveness. There are some of you who haven't forgiven your mother, your father, your sister, brother, haven't talked about it because they hurt you once, da, da, da. You must forgive or be damned. Today you're going to say the Lord's Prayer. And at Mass it says, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. So you're telling God today when you say this prayer, if I forgive others, forgive me. If I don't forgive others, damn me. Right? Because he says it right after he says, explain, right after in Matthew's Gospel, he teaches us the Lord's Prayer. He says, if you forgive the sins of others, your Heavenly Father will forgive you yours. If you do not forgive others, Neither will your father forgive you. Now you might sit there and say, I'm not going to do it. I'll go to hell. Yes, you will. It's just that simple. Well, you don't forgive someone. Does it do anything to them? No, it destroys you like a cancer inside. Like I'm sure you heard the story. It's kind of like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. It just doesn't work. It's not a feeling. It's an act of the will. Father, I forgive them and I ask you to forgive them. Done. It's a done deal. It's an act of the will. And you might sit there and say, Father, I, you don't know what it's like, what I had to go through. Oh, please. We all have our, our walk and our struggles. I entered seminary and I was 17 years old, quite young. I'm still a lifer. Can you tell I'm going to be 60 and I've been in this since I was 17? But when I was 17, young seminarian, the rector of the seminary sexually molested me. Now, I could sit there and tell the story the rest of my life that I'm a victim. I'm a survivor. I'm a warrior, gentlemen. Because I forgave him long ago. Not because of him. Because I wouldn't let that man make me a victim forever. God called me to more. And when Jesus was on the cross, the very first thing he said to the people that were killing him was what? forgive them we got to forgive so we can move on we got to forgive so we can stop sickness we got to forgive so we can become strong 
Never okays what they did. Still, they need to be punished. But you need to move on by forgiveness. And people, I know fathers who haven't talked to their sons over something stupid. You forgive. And you image to your children what forgiveness is. That's F. F is for faith and forgiveness. Next letter. A. A is for affirmation. What's A for? Affirmation. Gentlemen, you got to tell your wife and your kids something good. So what I always tell people is what I want you to do is say at least one good thing to your wife and kids every day. What? You say negative things every day to them. Why don't you say something good? If they don't find affirmation at home, and especially from their father, especially the girls, gentlemen, if they don't feel affirmed by their dad, they're going to look for a man who will affirm them and tell them how pretty they are. If you're not doing it. You know, once I was giving this talk, I was in Kansas City, Kansas, and then I had to go to Indianapolis, and it was a men's conference. They had 1,100 men there. It's a church very much like this in the round. And as I was speaking, I always scanned the thing because you can take me off on another one when somebody looked constipated. Hmm. And there was a kid in the back, about 17 years old. He had a mohawk. He had black fingernail polish. He had the pea coat. He had the black boots on. And he's like this all my talks because it was a men's conference. It was I spoke there from 9 to 5 just me hell on earth and so as he's sitting there he's going and I'm thinking okay I'm not, I miss this kid I can't sometimes you get sometimes you know and I'm saying goodbye and I'm running out and everybody's clapping as I'm walking out running out the door because I had to drive to Indianapolis this kid come running over to me and I thought he's gonna kill me <laughs> and he handed me this piece of paper and I'm thinking, oh dear. So every time I get pieces of paper, it's usually, Father, you're arrogant. Father, I don't like you. You scream a lot. You know, da, da, da. I get it, all those things. But I sat in the car and I thought, let's just get this over with. And I look at that and it says, Pox Omni, which means peace everywhere, which I didn't know. Anyway, so I open it up and this is what it says. Maybe one person in a thousand years dies from too much praise. Every minute a kid dies inside from lack of it. Do we praise our children? our spouses. Some of them hate to see you coming home because you're always negative. Do you affirm your family? If not, who will? A is for affirmation. M is for make memories. What's M for? Make memories. Gentlemen, you got to have dinner with your family. You just got to. You know, whether it's once a week or whether it's every night, you got to take time to be with them. If not, what are you saying? Well, my kids are in sports, Father, like I was. Great job. Then you're saying if they don't have dinner together because they're playing sports, you're saying sports is more important than family. You start. You got to have time together. What your kids do? They come home and they find something in the microwave and they turn it on and they watch TV. Great dinner. That's not going to help them 30 years from now. You got to create memories and you got to have times of joy. You know, I, I, have to, I used to have dinner with these Kasekis and they were great. She was, uh, the woman, mother was from uh, Carmela and she had three boys and a girl. The boys were all in seminary with me. One became a ranger, one became the rector of my seminary and uh, one was a priest, but it really doesn't count. He's a Jesuit. But anyway, <laughs> he's the head Jesuit in the United States. But the reality is, I used to love to go to their dinner because it would take hours and we would laugh and laugh and laugh. And one day we laughed so hard, the girl who's now a doctor laughed so hard she peed herself. What a memory. Do you have such joyful time at your dinner table that some of the kids would pee themselves? If not, that's why God sent me to you today, gentlemen. It's time. Let's have make memories around our dinner table. Next letter. I. I is for intimacy. What's I for? Intimacy. Intimacy means, gentlemen, into me see. We all come around with these masks. Family got to be the place of intimacy. So one of the things I encourage you to do is when you come home, it, every day take time and ask your wife, those of you who are married, how are you? Now, what did you do? How are you? I have anger issues, gentlemen. I don't know if you can tell. I go to anger management counseling every week when I'm home for the last year. I'm much better, thank you very much. But anyway, 
I have issues because my father was an alcoholic, because I was molested. All these things create issues in a person. I, you know, once someone read my Be a Man book and they wrote me and they said, Father, you have issues. I said, Sir, I have a lot of issues. That's part of the reality. But the reality is we need intimacy in our families. You know, I'm always on the road, all this stuff, and I'm always, you know, every time, Father, you got me a minute, 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 just a minute, Father. And so everywhere I go, they just take everything from me. And I was home Christmas, and I was on the road, I was so crazy, I was wrapping Christmas presents, and I was crying because I had to drive to Pittsburgh. I had nothing left to give. I was a mess. Got everything wrapped, dropped them at the, my mom's house, dropped everything off, the kids were still young. I had Merry Christmas! And I went down to split-level house, and I just closed the door. My mother came down, knocked on the door, came in, and she sat there across from me, and she said, Larry, what's the matter? Nobody once the whole year before ever asked me what the matter was. Only my mother had intimacy. You know, the problem with anger isn't the anger. It's the way we protect ourselves from either fear or hurt. And that's the way we learn to protect ourselves. But if someone comes to us and says, what, what's, what are you afraid of? What are you hurt by? The anger will go. We need intimacy in our family. So you begin it with your wife every day to take each of your kids once a week and say, hey, how are you? They need to be able to tell you anything as their dad without you killing them. Doesn't mean you don't punish them, but it means they trust you, that they want intimacy with you. Because when they're naked in front of you, you love them more than anybody else on this earth. I is for intimacy. L is for love. You got that one. That's easy enough. But we're going to skip to the last part. The last letter is Y. It's all about you. It's not about me. Family, forget about me. I love you. So Father Stan Fortuna has a song out. So again, if you haven't done it before, I've told you before, you put three words on your mirror. What are the three words everybody here who's heard me before should have on their mirror? I am third. I am third. God is first. Others are second. I am last. You exist, gentlemen, to give up your life every day for your wife and kids. So every night when you're brushing your teeth, do do, and you see that thing in the mirror, that I do at least one unselfish act today for my wife and kids, besides go to work for them. Shut up. <laughs> Did you do an unselfish act for your wife and kids? If not, you wasted your life today as a Christian. We come back to L. You've heard the story, I won't tell it again. But we gotta be love in a world that doesn't know love, and it gotta be with your families, gentlemen. You gotta tell your families you love them every day. He has got it. You know, years ago, I was at one of the kids who became a professional football player. He has a book coming out in a couple months, and I'm in there. And he come and he talked to me about it, and I said, sure. And, but anyway, in the midst of it, when he was in high school, he's playing. He was a big football player, and I'm taking him out to pizza and wings. We're going, I'm typing in a typewriter. Remember typewriters? And as I'm typing at this typewriter, he got real quiet. He's a big talker. And I stopped, and I go, what? And this big football player starts shaking, and he starts sobbing uncontrollably. And I can't take crying, especially amongst guys. I have intimacy issues. And I just said, what's the matter? What's the matter? What's the matter? What can I do for you? And he says, Father, I'd do anything if my dad just told me once that he loved me. The only thing this kid ever wanted from his dad was for his dad to tell him that he loved him. That's all he wanted. But his dad showed him. He was at all his games. He was at everything. Very proud of him. But then one day he calls me and says, Father, my dad's dying. Can you come over and anoint him? And I went over and I anointed his father. And later that day, his father passed away. Not because I anointed him. It was that time. But anyway, <laughs> after the funeral, I sat there and I said to this big man who's now 40 years old at that time, Son, did your dad ever tell you that he loved you? This big man started to sob and cry uncontrollably. Never, Father. Jesus only gave us one commandment, John chapter 13, verse 34. This is my commandment, love one another as I have loved you. Verse 35, the very next verse says, this is how all people will know you're my disciples. John chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus says, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. 
Jesus told the disciples that he loved them. Gentlemen, God commands you. You must tell your wife and your kids that you love them every day. Period. Don't give me the stuff that I'm Italian, we do it all the time, or I'm German, we don't do it, or I'm Irish, we do it when we're drunk. You don't let your culture determine that. Your faith got to do that. So gentlemen, that's the call. In this thing, you're called to get out of the way. Know that Christ lives inside of you. Let Christ love people through you. Be love in a world that doesn't know love. Begin with your family. And family means you're an example of faith and forgiveness. There's affirmation there. You make memories with your family. You have intimacy with your family. You love your family and you tell them that you love them every day. And it's all about you. It's not about me. I'm done, gentlemen, so please pray for me as I head back. I have to be in Miami all week on Monday. I'll be at my parish tomorrow. The devil's been after me, gentlemen, and he's, you know, he's after me because he knows if he pulls me down, he's going to pull a lot of people down with me. So I just beg you. I know I might be the most arrogant priest you ever met. I have a lot of issues. You just pray for me, please, that I always stay faithful to God. I always stay faithful to the church. I never do anything to bring scandal. Would you please pray for me? And I promise you for the rest of my life, I'll pray for you twice a day, every morning and every night. And like I say, the good die young, so I'll be around 120. So I'll be praying for you a lot. God bless you, gentlemen. Thank you very much.